Hello one and all, welcome to Seen Through Glass. If you've never seen this channel before, welcome. My name is Sam and last year in 2019, I took on my biggest adventure yet, trying to travel through 36 countries in just 12 months, all with an aim of discovering what car culture was like around the world. Because in 2018, my channel was viewed in over 120 countries and I wanted to understand what it meant to be a petrol head and a seen through glass viewer in Australia and Tokyo and Dubai and America and God knows where else. So once I convinced my girlfriend Vicky to join me, we picked the car that we were going to use for the majority of the trip, a 911 Carrera T. We packed up our bags and on the 4th of January 2019, we boarded a plane to Brisbane, Australia to kickstart drive the world. This is it, the start of drive the world. After a lot of hype, we are underway. And you join me in Australia, Brisbane, Australia. I'm gonna be exploring as much of this country as possible. And I'm gonna kick things off by finally reuniting with my car. This is weird. This is so weird. I'm driving my car in Australia. Those first few days were a bit of a blur, I think mainly because of the jet lag, but also because we just didn't really know what we were doing. We were finding our feet with how Drive the World would work on a day-to-day -day level. I remember one of the first things we did was take the 911 to get the sponsor logos applied to it. We spent like four or five hours just standing around an industrial state in a not very nice part of Brisbane being like, is this it? Is this drive the world. But things definitely picked up on day two when we headed to somewhere called Mount Tambourine, about an hour outside of Brisbane, to film a Jaguar D-type recreation owned by a guy called Johnny. And the place was just stunning. We met up at this hotel, which was previously a private house owned by Mel Gibson. And the sort of village or town that we used as a base was this kind of hippie, trendy, crystal and palm reading hub. I mean, Vicky just was in her element. I think it wasn't really until the end of the week that we started to feel a little bit more normal. I feel like I've taken a few steps in the right direction in the battle of jet lag. I'm feeling a bit more normal today. And so we've come to Australia Zoo. Me and my sister growing up were obsessed with watching Mr. Steve Irwin, the crocodile hunter. Let's face it, we all know Australia is full of animals that want to kill you. As a Brit traveling there, I think you're always terrified of, of drop bears and, and spiders that can kill you by looking at you. So as well as sort of wanting to go to Australia Zoo to relive my childhood, I was also doing it as a bit of a research project. So I knew as we traveled through the country, if we saw snakes and spiders, we could work out which ones were the, the super deadly ones. But it was also the first kind of touristy thing we got to do since we landed. We'd just been so busy and we had the morning off because that evening we we're going to be attending my first ever meet and greet. Sam was trying to make time to talk to everybody, have a proper chat with, with every single person that was there which was just impossible. I was trying to figure out a system where, you know, there's a line of people waiting to speak to Sam, but then that was just a, a really stupid way of approaching it and totally not what Sam is like. So we just tried to speak to as many people as possible. It was a shame we couldn't talk to everybody, but it was nothing like we expected. Now I know fully well, lots of you are Golf R fans. However, I'm a particular fan of this one because let me bring you around here for this. <laughs> this is unbelievable. <laughs> Drive safe. That car, that Merc, the maddest thing here by far. I think he was saying 1100 newton meters of torque, 800 odd horsepower. <laughs> That 
that was a crazy evening. I have to say a huge thanks to the car style crew guys for setting it up, because I was really hesitant when they first got in touch. I just don't think my self-confidence could handle the idea of a scene through glass meet and greet. But yeah, I'm so glad we did it, because I met so many incredible, nice people that were just so encouraging about everything we were doing. I left feeling exhausted, but also so motivated for the road ahead. And that was the last thing we did in Brisbane. It was time to pack up the 911 for the first time, which, yeah, that was a little bit complicated. I couldn't work out where all the bags were supposed to go. But once I did, we started the car up and hit the road to begin our kind of road trip section of Australia. The first big drive of the trip then was from Brisbane down to Sydney. Now there are plenty of guides out there telling you to do this trip in seven or 14 days. There's just so much to do, so much to see. But because of the logistics of the trip, we were gonna have to do it in two days. Yeah, this became a kind of theme of the entire year. Traveling the world in 12 months, just it's just not that long, I'm gonna be honest with you. So whilst we had a big journey ahead of us and lots that we wanted to see, I think we were pretty damn excited to be hitting the road and seeing what Australia had to offer. I love the beach. If I could live on a beach, I would. So we had to stop at Byron Bay. It's one of the most famous surf spots in Australia and there was no way we were driving past and not stopping there. We went to the main beach first, which was super overcrowded. I mean, amazing, but very overcrowded. We spotted a guy with a drone that was just tracking something in the water um, and we thought that there was maybe some sort of accident. Then we got close. Uh, it looked like he was just tracking a shark that was supposed to be in the water. And I don't know whether you know, but Sam is terrified of the sea and anything that lives in the sea, especially sharks. Trying to look for a really good empty beach around Byron Bay and just exploring the area in general really slowed us down. So by the time we had to leave, the sun had already set. In the build-up to our Australian journey, and also during my time in Brisbane, I'd received so many warnings from locals about driving in Australia at dawn, dusk, or night. And that's because of the wildlife you might encounter when the sun goes down. People would come up to me in the middle of nowhere just being like, have you hit a kangaroo yet? Ah, oh, don't worry, you will. <laughs> they were just scaring the life out of me. So as we headed off towards our overnight stop and the sun was setting and the views were absolutely amazing, I was stressed out of my brain. I literally was holding the steering wheel so tightly, just staring down the road. I had every single light on, the spotlights, the, the front lights on full beam. I think I even had the interior lights on being like, I will not hit a kangaroo. I think Vicky at one point was like, oh babe, like, should we put some different music on? I was like, don't, don't talk to me. Do not talk to me. I am watching out for ruse. Amazingly, we did manage to get to our overnight stop in one piece. We arrived there around 1 a.m. But quite unbelievably, the next morning, I woke up and I went to get something from the car and there were literally like three kangaroos in the field next to the car, like taunting me, being like, you might have got away last night, mate, but we are always around. Watch out. Anyway, I was relieved to find that Port Macquarie, the, the place we'd stopped off at, was the most idyllic little surf spot. And because of jet lag, we'd woken up early. We went down to this amazing breakfast spot on the beach. It was just like, it's called Salty Crew Kiosk. It's where all the sort of yummy mummies go to do their beach yoga in the morning. So we were surrounded by this kind of like middle-aged women all gossiping about local town antics uh, and I'm just there like sipping on my latte being like oh my god Darren slept with Lisa no way after about 17 iced lattes and 52 acai bowls and just photographing everything it was time to get back on the road and do that second leg of the journey down towards Sydney final stop before Sydney then and I have popped down to the Gosford Classic Car Museum. <laughs> Had to check the name there. There could not be a more perfect entrance for me. La Ferrari is the very first thing I see. Oh my God, look at the green on this baby. DBRS9. Oh, from Le Mans. One of 26 ever built. So that's effectively a Le Mans race car. 
Sadly, that museum has now closed. I think there was a bit of a tax confusion or something. Well, maybe a bit dodgy. I don't know. But anyway, fortunately, it no longer exists. But I'm super glad I stopped off because, yeah, an eclectic range of cars from LaFerraris through to like historic Aussie muscle cars. It was just, it was a cool thing to see it and abandoned. We were the only people there. But then finally, we had arrived into Sydney. Today is the first convoy cruise of Drive the World. I don't know if this says more about the roads or your driving. <laughs> 720 S's are yeah, very I comfortable. <laughs> I just said this. Yeah. So this is it, Maguire Pass apparently. And it's a case of wait and squirt. Which actually sounded a bit rude. I probably shouldn't have phrased it like that. But what I meant was, you gotta hold back, stay away from the traffic and then go, 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 and then slow down. Wait for the traffic, go, 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 go. Right, unexpected change of plan. Um, I've just been told uh, that I will not make the Porsche event, which is being hosted for me, uh, if I stick around, have lunch and continue the drive. I have to leave now. Now I call this the kind of Sydney section of the Australian trip, but, but actually we weren't staying in Sydney. We were about an hour and a half north in the Northern Beaches territory, somewhere called Palm Beach. And that's because my godmother's actually Australian. She has an amazing house in Palm Beach. She was there with her entire family at the same time we were. So it was like the perfect combination. And oh, the place was a dream. Weirdly, we'd been listening to a podcast on the way there about like a kind of murder and missing persons case in the Northern Beaches territory. So we were a little bit like, oh, it's a bit unnerving, but yeah, the house and the company made up for it. We were so happy, what a beautiful area. Sydney actually turned out to be quite a Porsche-centric stop. Not only did we do the sort of meetup at the Porsche Centre, but I also got invited to do a photo shoot and an interview for Porsche's Instagram magazine, Type 7. They linked me up with a local photographer called Thomas Walk, who also shoots for my favourite brand ever, Deus. He took some amazing shots of the 911 down by the Opera House and the Sydney Harbour Bridge. But he also recommended a great road right by where we were staying, kind of near the Pitwater Bay. And so one morning we got up really early to drive that before anyone else was around. And oh, it lived up to all the expectations that he'd set for it. On top of that, one of the last things I did in Sydney was to visit Auto House Hamilton, a kind of one of the world's greatest Porsche specialists. If you want to uh, restore or maintain or modify your 911 or other Porsche model, these are one of the go-to guys in the entire world. So I was there drooling over GT2 RSs and original Carrera GTs, and I even got to do a quick test drive, one of their kind of Group 4 inspired Resto Mod 911s. That was really the last thing we did before we packed our bags once again and hit the road, leaving Sydney behind us. You can get stuff everywhere. So good. Don't just say this. We've just we've just stopped for fuel. It's fairly obvious we're at slight a fuel pump. <laughs> Where do you think we are? Not a Starbucks, are we? Well, you need to see it. We've just stopped for fuel, and I found a kombucha inside and some water. Why is this all open? What about the bug that you couldn't find in the car? Oh yeah, there's another bug in the car. We've got we've had quite a few bugs today. A in the bug car. with wings. A flying bug attacked the floor of your seat, didn't it? Attacked your feet, and now it's disappeared. So it might reappear, which could be quite dangerous. Um, even though I'm pretty sure it's just a fly. So just stopped off at 
Caltex, no idea if this is supposed to be good fuel or not, um, to go to, uh, to fill up, but also go to the loo. And whilst I was in the loo, there was only one cubicle. Some guy came in and like pushed the door, which was clearly locked. He then started really pushing the door, then put his like foot under the door to try and like ram it open. So I was like, okay, am I gonna get raped? And so I was like, excuse me, someone is in here. And he went, ah, oh, all right, mate. How long are you gonna be? Okay, quite some time, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, right, and he stormed out, so it was not uh, the most relaxing. Uh... I mean, who asks how long you're going to be? Oh, that's a good question. As if anyone ever knows how long they're going to be. Well, yeah, but uh, is it a quick one, or is it going to be a drawn-out process? <laughs> oh, sometimes you do know, don't you? Sometimes it's just like... I guess. And then sometimes it's like Frodo, never wants to let go of the ring. Okay. Oh, no, so this is another huge... I'm not going, I'm not going down there. All of these... All of They're these crazy. entry and exit points are everywhere. So crazy steep. drivers. Not crazy drivers. I've got to get off a cliff to get out of this petrol station. My poor front splitter is ruined. Well, welcome to our mansion in the Seahorse Inn. Uh, this is Eden, which is kind of the midway point for our coastal drive from Sydney across to Melbourne. I'm so glad we took this route today because I was at one point going to take the Hume Highway, which is a much more direct route, but everyone told me it was super boring. Uh, and today was definitely not boring, but look, at, I've got so much space. So I need to edit. I've got a vlog. I'm late on the vlog, so I'm going to edit that now, have some food, get some rest and crack on tomorrow. This was the problem yesterday, my gimbal was freaking out and now it's up, now it's alive. Ah! Come on, fly it. I'm not gonna fly with a helicopter, it's very dangerous. It's gone, it's gone, it's gone, it's gone. It's okay, gone. now yeah, it's gone. Right, come on, little bruv. Packing this car every day is like an extreme version of CrossFit meets Tetris. It always absolutely knackers me and it's very precise, but somehow it works. The 911 is just so spacious. Right, let's go. Welcome to Can River. Um, taking a bit of a morning off. Uh, my girlfriend Vicky has been driving, which meant I got to get an extra 20 minutes of sleep uh, and do a bit of filming and catch up on some emails. No, uh, no V power here, but for premium, a full tank, 97 odd dollars. So that's what, 50 odd quid for a full tank? Not going to complain. For some reason I was only ever allowed to drive the 911 when there were no cars around or when there was a lot of roadworks. So it just made my experience with the car not as enjoyable as maybe Sam's experience with the car. But nonetheless, it was just a really, really good car to drive, super easy and I felt super confident in it. Welcome to Painesville. I'm tempted to whisper because this could be one of the quietest towns in Australia. Oh my God, a car's coming. Civilization, life. <laughs> I mean, this is, I guess, a part of the fact that Australia is huge. Uh, you get to these sort of communities that just feel empty. Oh my, oh. That was the first time I'd got into the car after Vicky had been driving and I just couldn't believe how close she sat to the wheel. But anyway, after our sort of mistakes during our drive from Brisbane down to Sydney with regards to kind of getting distracted and spending too much time at Byron Bay, we were keen to learn from that and employ some new tactics for our drive across 
to Melbourne. So we were still going to try and stop off and see as much as we could, but with strict time limits. And actually, we introduced something called the Run for the Waterfall, which was a way to not only do a bit of sightseeing, but also a bit of exercise, because, yeah, spending a lot of time in the car, yeah, you don't get much exercise. So, yes, we introduced these kind of waterfall runs where we would literally be driving along the road and see a point of interest, pull over, literally run to that place, take some photos, take it in, and then run back to the car and keep going. So we minimized the time that we'd stopped driving, but, but got some exercise and, and seen something interesting. And kind of wildlife or nature played a big part in that. Anytime that there was a sort of sign for like, you know, lizard sanctuary or koala viewing spot, whatever it might be, one of the best places we did that was Raymond Island. The place was just full of the most amazing animals. Also gave me my chance to drive the 911 on a kind of dirt road for the first time. So yeah, I was pretty happy. There's one. Yeah. There's one. Oh, oh my god. Can you see it? It's scratching. Wait. Oh, that was a bad angle. Let Go me back, back it up. Sick. Come on. Wow, what a lad. Cute. That one's like. Awake and he's punching. Punching himself in the face. From that idyllic sort of nature reserve though, with the blink of an eye, we were then in Melbourne, which turned out to be the kind of most urban city or the most urban experience that we had whilst in Australia. This is our home for the next five days here in Melbourne. City Tempo Apartments, which is in the CBD, the Central Business District. And look, we are on the 26th floor my vertigo is not having that good a time. However, we've got pretty cool views of the city and what I'm reading as Queen Victoria Market. I think I mentioned it a few different places on social media. Melbourne is the place where I'm going to be the busiest. The opportunities are lined up, the stuff that's going on. I think I'm making sort of two, maybe even three videos every day. Now, I don't know what it is about me staying in high-rise apartments in Australian cities that always leads to rain, but yes, it, it's raining once again. I mean, this is not the Australia I was promised. It also wasn't the perfect weather for me to have my first and only go in an Australian ute. Now, if you don't know what a ute is, it's a kind of crossover between a saloon and a pickup. They're, they're iconically Australian, and there's a sort of big battle that goes on between Ford and Holden over who makes the best, and you're either a Ford guy or a Holden guy, and like a Ford Mustang versus a Chevy Camaro, I guess. But, but because of the rain and a few other things that were going on, yeah, I could only drive it around a kind of industrial estate at pretty slow speed. So I was a bit upset about that, but it was still cool. It's still a chance to get up close with one and learn a lot. Mike was such a nice guy and taught me a lot about the whole Holden versus Ford thing and kind of what utes are all about. Fast forward to the evening, um, had a bit of a chill hour or so, because yeah, it was knackering exploring Melbourne. But we're now heading out to dinner with a guy called Jesse, who runs, I think it's Otium or Optium Club here in Melbourne, big supercar club, and he's very kindly offered to take us out for dinner in one of apparently Melbourne's best restaurants. So let's see what this food's all about. Well, I'm assuming this is our ride for the evening. <laughs> what a lad. Dude, oh, so yeah. nice to meet you. Nice how you doing? Nice to meet you too. How are you? This Pleasure. This is cool. So this is my girlfriend Vicky. Hello, how are you? Jesse, nice to meet you. Pleasure. Oh, you we're very European. Oh, we're very yeah. European Pleasure. in there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Man, nice. you well, picked us up we're, in we're, style, right? We're a very, right? uh, European city here in Melbourne. So far, I've only seen Merck C63. So this, oh, okay. is, this is a nice this is step a nice up. Step up. <laughs> That was actually a great evening. Jesse was a really, really nice guy and arranged an amazing dinner with a whole load of sort of local Melbourne car guys. And we just had an awesome time. So yeah, we remember that night very fondly. The next day though, it was time for another meetup. I mean, I'm really starting to sound like Justin Bieber here, aren't I? Just meetups all over town. But a big local dealership called Lawbeck arranged to, yes, arrange another one of these evenings. Now, I don't know which was bigger, Brisbane or Melbourne in terms of the meetup, but the Lawbeck one felt pretty huge i have to say can you see it oh look at that what a color i don't even think that's irish green is it irish green maybe it is it's hard to tell here because i'm looking through two uh two big glass windows so the color might not be coming out properly but we are looking at a 911 with oh, and the, oh we're going porsche crazy people it's kicking off but yes green porsches for the win this is absolutely stunning 
Well, Melbourne is a special city and we love our cars a little bit more than every other city in Australia. Is that right? So going on my judgment of the fact there's an Aventador S parked out there, let me just point you to the first page of today's menu where there is a beef burger for $130 for a beef burger. Nick, I don't know where you bought us. The right place. <laughs> the right place. <laughs> the LFA day was probably one of my favorite days of the entire year. That car is just so iconic. And Lexus Australia literally said, here are the keys for the day, like go have fun. And what a place to have fun, the Yarra Valley on the Black Spur Road. That is literally the road out of Forza. And then to top it all off, that evening, we had tickets to the Australian Open. I'd booked sort of random quarterfinal tickets, not really knowing who we'd end up seeing. And the match we got was Federer versus Tsitsipasis. Tsitsipas. Sam kept getting it wrong, but it's Titi Pass. Uh, it was such a cool game, really amazing to see Federer, and it was a great day overall. I mean, Yarra Valley is amazing, the wine was amazing, uh, the LFA was amazing, and the game was amazing. So it was one of our really, really good memories from Australia. Let's try to love you and me. Why don't we feel like Melbourne just continued to spoil me. I visited Dutton's Garage, which is arguably one of the greatest modern classic supercar dealerships in the world. They have the most incredible coffee shop inside the dealership. I was like, this place is my heaven. I also got to see the Frisco 911 for the first time, the car that inspired the look of my 911 Carrera T, but, but more on that later because the owner, Andre, wasn't there at the time, but I did meet up with him later in the year. So yeah, we'll, we'll come back to that car. I also met up with a guy called Dean, who quite unbelievably owns a Mercedes 190E that was previously owned by Ayrton Senna. Actually, Senna had ordered the car during his time, I think it was at Lotus back in the UK. So hearing those stories and, and getting a chance to get up close and personal with that car right around the corner from the Albert Park F1 track felt pretty damn special. Prior to this trip, I would say the most visually spectacular road I've ever driven on is the Pacific Coast Highway in America. Every time I drive that road, I'm just blown away. However, the Great Ocean Road is right up there. I mean, they're on a level playing field because to coin a phrase from the Stradman, that thing just delivers views on views. 
every corner of the Great Ocean Road that you go around just there's another amazing beach or rock cliff and and for the majority of it you are just literally driving along the sea and there's so many great surf towns with amazing food and and drinks and I think we both loved every second of it and then the big highlight being the 12 apostles For those of you that don't know, back in the day, Adelaide used to host the Formula One Grand Prix before Melbourne kind of stole it. But I feel like the Adelaide petrol heads never really recovered from that. So a couple of enthusiasts who were relatively wealthy decided to set up this place, The Bend, a big motorsport park. It's kind of like an up-to-date, state-of-the-art facility with everything from a full track that can be split into different configurations to off-roading and go-karting and drag strips and drifting. Pretty damn impressive. However, when we visited, it was really only the track that was fully set up. So I've got to get back there at some point and check it out. But I feel like in years to come, if F1 still exists, uh, they will definitely be trying to compete for that race. Because yeah, it's a mighty impressive setup. I can't believe that there are koalas in the trees that are within reaching distance of the balcony of our Airbnb. Especially after today we tried to go to a koala sanctuary to see someone, now they're right there. One of the biggest decisions we had when planning the Australian leg of the journey was whether or not we were going to drive to Perth. If you don't know your Australian geography, Perth is a real sort of outlier. It's about two and a half thousand kilometers away from Adelaide and it's completely the opposite side of the country from Sydney and, and Melbourne. So it's really just, just out there and really the only way to get there is either to fly or drive across this kind of vast expanse of nothingness called the Nullarbor. Now when you research this Nullarbor, everyone tells you that it's like a near-death experience. Like it's super hard to survive and you need to stock up on water and food and spare tires and there's nowhere to stay and nowhere to get fuel and all these different elements. And I was like, I'm not sure we're gonna get across this in a 911, even though it claimed that the whole road is paved, I still was just a bit nervous. Sam and I are both not very adventurous. For those who know us, they know that we don't really take huge risks. We want to be safe from any way we can. So the prospects of crossing the Nullarbor and how much research and how much people were telling us not to go made us terrified. So Sam was very close to not doing it and not crossing the Nullarbor and perhaps trucking the car across. And it just felt like really defeating the point of this trip, uh, which was to just push ourselves a little bit further not too far, but a little bit further. Um, so I convinced him that we should just do it and for once take a little bit of a risk and a little bit of a gamble. Uh, and you know, what was the worst that could happen? We were just going to get eaten by kangaroos. Now our plan in Adelaide was to go to the shops and stock up on supplies and jerry cans and really anything else we thought might be useful. Whilst we were doing so, Adelaide was experiencing a heat wave and actually record temperatures of 47 degrees Celsius. I mean, it's, it's like walking through an oven, like my contact lenses would dry up on my eyes the minute I opened a door. It was the most bizarre experience. And every shop we would go into, people were like, you, you shouldn't be out, mate, like go home. Imagine just sitting out on the Nullarbor watching the snakes by our feet. Yeah, tanning in 50 degrees heat. Once we had stocked up though, we loaded up the car and it was time to set off on what we thought was going to be a near-death experience. Now day one was largely uneventful. We set off from Adelaide nice and early and actually met up with the guys from Sports Car Safari for a quick photo shoot before we headed out of town. They also took us to one of the best coffee shops I've ever been to, let alone one of the best in Australia. And after that, it was a sort of six hour drive through, again, empty open land, but not particularly inspiring empty open land. Day one, as mentioned, was largely uneventful. The drive from Adelaide to our kind of first 
overnight stop. However, it is the time we got our one and only speeding ticket from the entire trip. Can you believe it? in the desert, in the middle of nowhere. I mean, we hardly saw another person, yet we went around the corner at 1.10 or 15 kilometers an hour over the limit and there was literally a police car coming the other way. Apparently, the Nullarbor is quite well or heavily patrolled because there's a lot of uh, freight, I guess, truck freight that moves around and also the big open stretches. People do tend to drive pretty recklessly. So yeah, I still can't believe it. Our one and only speeding ticket in the desert. I'm continuously blown away by how practical this car is. We are putting so much stuff in it every day, and whilst it is like a complex Tetris game, it just all seems to just fit in perfectly, and we seem super comfy. Um, now today is, is a bit of a sort of journey into the unknown. It's not obvious where we'll be staying tonight. So the only place that was really frequently mentioned in our guide and online was the Eucla Motor Hotel or the Eucla Roadhouse. Sam decided to upgrade us to a business suite. Now, I don't think anyone had stayed in the business suite for probably since it was created. There were thousands of spiders, which was my worst nightmare. And, uh, you know, there was a gap under the front door, which was about that big which absolutely terrified me to the point where I didn't sleep all night because I just knew something was going to get under that door. A rattlesnake, a kangaroo, a koala, but I just stayed awake. Uh, and I think I stayed awake throughout the whole of the crossing of the Nullarbor. Probably the most iconic part of the Nullarbor is this, the 90 mile straight. Now, it's not like we've been uh, in shortage of straight roads on this journey. However, this one is dead straight for 146 kilometers. <laughs> In general, I think we both remember the Nullarbor as one of the greatest parts of the entire Drive the World adventure, because it, it was just that, it was an adventure. It's truly an amazing experience. I feel like Vicky and I were kind of prepared for it. We're very used to doing long journeys in the car, so four 10-hour days back-to-back -back driving on pretty straight roads didn't really phase us. Maybe others would be phased by that. In general, if you ever contemplate doing it, I strongly recommend it. Just, just be prepared and know what you're signing up for. I have to say though, by the time we got to Perth, we were definitely ready for a bit of relaxation and a, and a bit of luxury. Luckily, my friend Josh, who had sort of helped plan a lot of the Australian leg, really came through with that luxury. Uh, you join me at the South of Perth Yacht Club because today I'm swapping my 911 Carrera T for a boat. So Rodnest was another one of those beachy, amazing locations that I really, really didn't want to skip. Um, you know, lots of people had recommended that we go there. It's supposed to be really close to Perth. The main reason why I want to go there was not the beach this time, but the quokkas. The quokkas are these little creatures that kind of look like small kangaroos, uh, but also guinea pigs. They only live on that one island in Australia and you can't see them anywhere else. And the quokka selfie is a really famous thing online. So we just thought we have to do it. We have come to the main sort of port or jetty of Rottnest Island, if there is such a thing. You can see there's a few sort of pubs and restaurants behind us and we're going to be getting some lunch, but also attempting to find these damn quokkas. 
quokka found. Look at this little guy. He does look a bit like a giant rat, but a tiny bit sweeter and cuter. Now these are famous because you can supposedly take quite good selfies with them. I'm not really sure I want to disturb his lunchtime though. I feel a bit awkward getting so close as he's just chilling. He's got a cute face at the minute. I'm just making him look very rat-like. So let me see if I can capture his face. Might be a girl, who knows. Hey, Quokka. Quokka. Hello. Yes, he's busy. <laughs> uh, actually, much harder to take a selfie with a quokka than you might think, or at least Instagram leads you to believe. Rotnest itself, unbelievable. I mean, absolutely incredible island. Beaches, crystal blue waters, etc., etc. Well worth the adventure. We're now headed back onto the boat towards Perth. After our day of relaxation, I was definitely ready to sort of get back at it. And after my failed filming experience with the ute in Melbourne, I still wanted to kind of tap into a little bit more of the local Australian car culture. So I took myself down to whoop ass Wednesday. I feel, feel like I'm still not saying that in a cool or credible way, but basically a big kind of burnout drag racing event, a, a proper Aussie experience. I even got the chance to get into a U during the actual burnout competition and I, I don't think I've ever had so much fun. I really, really enjoyed that. It was a really, a really fun evening. And with the blink of an eye, that kind of signed off our time in Australia. It was one of the last things we did. So I'm so glad I got it in. But yeah, it was time to pack up our bags, pack up the 911 and get ready for New Zealand. We have just packed up this car for the last time for two, two months because this is obviously the end of our first leg, the Australian leg of Drive the World. That also marks the end of our first leg with the Carrera T because now it heads back to Europe. Um, it takes so long to ship this car across the world, two months, that it needs to go now so that we can start our European leg in March. So, oh, that's a bit wonky, isn't it? I mean... <laughs> now, if you are a new viewer to the channel, welcome to my favourite car of all time. Um, a car that needs its windows open because it's a little bit warm. Ooh. Sorry. Sitting next to me, Vicky, it is your first time ever in a Challenge Stradale. Thoughts? We haven't driven it yet, but it's, it looks a lot, it's a lot more raw than the 360, yeah. isn't it? Good description. Saying goodbye to two incredible cars today, Carrera T as it goes back to UK and the Stradale until I see one again. It was just too hard financially and logistically to take the 911 to all the countries that I wanted to visit. For example, flying the car down to New Zealand would have cost about £10,000. To ship it would have cost about £3,000, but it would have taken three weeks. So we left the car with my friend Josh, who was going to take it to the boatyard to load it up onto a ship so we could head back to Europe. Meanwhile, we headed to the airport for our flight to New Zealand. Now, this is going to be a bit of an interesting flight because we were flying with Air New Zealand and I'd booked one of their sky couches, which was kind of advertised as an economy class bed but actually it's three economy class seats in a row that you can kind of turn into a makeshift bed. The dream didn't quite live up to the reality though because oh my God, was it uncomfortable. <laughs> At first I was like, this is amazing. This is so great, like how exciting. And maybe if you're kind of small adult or, or a large child, it would have been incredible. But, but two fully grown adults trying to lie on this very small and narrow and awkward kind of bed, just it didn't work. And I remember waking up furious, being like, I would have slept better 
sitting upright. So yeah, that was a bit of a disaster. But anyway, no matter what, we had made our sort of seven hour overnight flight and landed in Auckland, New Zealand. And here is the car that I'm going to be using for the next few days on the North Island in New Zealand. The brand new, well it's actually not that brand new anymore, but the new Continental GT from Bentley. I'm a mess of tiredness and confusion, so most important thing in the entire world, let's go get coffee. I think we both admit that maybe it's the coffee talking, but oh, New Zealand's nice, isn't it? Oh, it's action stations from the minute we've landed, basically. Uh, we are headed today to something called Leadfoot. I believe it's called Leadfoot. Uh, and I think it's New Zealand's sort of, sort of version of Goodwood Festival Speed. Turned out, Leadfoot was quite literally the Kiwi Festival of Speed. It was the most amazing welcome to New Zealand. I was like, oh, well, well, we are set. This is gonna be a good few days. I mean, the car park alone was full of the most incredible supercars and collector cars. I was like, if this is what people are turning up in, what else am I gonna find during my time in New Zealand? I honestly loved it. And then the hill climb itself had drift cars and formula cars and supercars and McLaren Senna's taking part. The whole thing was incredible but as exciting as the kind of automotive side of New Zealand was, we had no idea the actual sort of the beauty and the scenery that was waiting for us once we left Leadfoot. We were so excited to explore New Zealand. The North Island felt like something that was a little bit more us just because the roads were empty and just beautiful. It felt like there was just so much beauty compact into one little space. Uh, and our best drives of the whole trip, and I'm sure Sam will agree with me here, was the Thermal Explorer Highway. I think that was the name. It was driving through the Coromandel through to Hastings. Uh, and it was just, I don't know, maybe it was just our moods, but it was just beautiful. There were lots of places and just place of natural beauty to stop at lots of mud pools and volcanic areas uh, but we had one of the most beautiful sunsets uh, and just drives in general it was just empty and nice be thinking, Sam, the Bentley has changed. <laughs> um, well, that's because we're no longer in it. Uh, you American viewers may recognize this as a Ford Raptor, but not just any Raptor. This is a Roush Raptor, 6.2 liter. And it's an absolute behemoth. Uh, and I've very kindly been given the keys to it today to explore. Built tough by Ford. Uh, driving this thing is like drive, listen to that. Uh, it's like driving a, a lorry, or, or what do you call it in America? Uh, uh, I don't know what they call them in America. Big truck. Big, yeah, the big, you know what I mean. Uh, so it's quite terrifying. I'm pretty sure I've run over a few children on the way here. I might have crushed a few cars too, but it's all in the name of fun. Isn't it? If you were to ask me if there was one video that you kind of wish had got a few more views during Drive the World, I would say it was the 918 versus 911R test drive video that I did. Both the cars of my friend, and he said, look, let's put a few hours aside, take the two cars, 
and do whatever you want with them. I mean, that doesn't happen. That's not real life. So we went to one of the most amazing local roads in his area, which was just perfect for driving those two cars. And initially jumped in the 911R and he was in the passenger seat and it was great and everything I kind of wanted it to be actually maybe better than I wanted it to be. And he kept going, you know, push it, go faster. You know, you need to really rev it out. And you know, whenever you have an owner encouraging you to drive their car fast, it's a little bit unnerving to begin with, but then amazing because you start to really get the rewards of the experience but the kind of joke came with the 918 spider i mean a hypercar a one million pound hypercar that he said oh yeah you jump in that now and follow me in the 911r and when he said follow me like i struggled to follow him he got into that 911 and thrashed it so i was like right here we go then let's do this <laughs> right off we go then Some unforgettable days then on the Northern Ireland and a huge thanks to that friend. He knows exactly who he is. But because of the sort of compact nature of our time in New Zealand, we actually decided to fly down to the South Island rather than try and drive and get the ferry. Initially, I wanted to spend about 10 days in New Zealand. I mean, even that would have been too short, but it had to get truncated even more because of some commitments in Asia. So we were only there for about six days and it just would have taken too long to drive. So yes, we left the Bentley on the Northern Ireland, jumped onto a, a tiny plane where I passed out a little bit uh, and made our way down to the South Island where we were going to kind of do a little bit more exploring. There wasn't so much car content planned there. It's just a chance for us to kind of see what was supposed to be one of the most beautiful places in the world. And, and apart from maybe a little bit of cloud on the first day, my God, did it live up to those expectations. South Island felt a little bit more familiar. It felt like a mix between Switzerland uh, and maybe Canada, but it was so beautiful and amazing and we were really excited to get to Queenstown. Now Sam decided to go a little bit off-piste here and book us some quirky retreat hotel called the Sherwood. It was really cool, don't get me wrong, but definitely not very us and definitely not very Sam. Uh, everything in that place was just made from recycled materials, you know, tyres, it was very basic and stripped down and it was one of the stops that we were really uh, looking forward to getting a bit of a break in. The Sherwood Community Eco Recycled Hotel just made it slightly less enjoyable but nonetheless we decided to get out uh, and explore, do a couple of hikes. We did the Tiki Trail up to the gondola which was really amazing, really knackered us out. Uh, at that point, you know, there was not a lot of exercise that was getting done. Now before we leave New Zealand entirely and head on to Singapore, there is one final bit of New Zealand or Kiwi car culture that I want to indulge in. And when you see in a second what it is, I think you'll all understand why I wanted to indulge in it. Since 
I started Drive the World, I've had a lot of sort of inquiries or attention from the Porsche community. It's probably because I picked a 911 as the main car to use as I did this adventure. Now, of course, I do love Porsche and I've, I, my eyes have been open to them, but let's face it, you all know that my heart lies with these guys. kind of weird because looking back now we were in New Zealand for such a short time. I did do quite a lot if you think about it we landed on the Sunday and did Leadfoot Festival. Monday drove that amazing thermal explorers expressway or highway down through the Northern Ireland in a Bentley Continental GT. Tuesday spent the day driving a 918 and a 911R. Wednesday flew down to the South Island and drove all the way down to Queenstown. Thursday had that kind of day off to relax. Friday, making our way back to Auckland where I filmed one of the most amazing Ferrari collections I've ever seen before then heading off on Saturday. But still, it's one of the favorite places that we went during the year. I mean, I really need to get back to New Zealand, mainly because I think there's untapped potential in terms of car content. How much did I do or get to see during such a short period of time? Absolutely unreal. I mean, one thing I never even talked about was the fact we went to a, a specialist who's kind of resto modding Jaguars, the guys there taking the, the innards of modern XCs and XFs and F types and putting them into old classic E types and God knows what other Jaguars. That was an amazing business and I never really got the chance to talk about it or showcase it. So, yes, New Zealand is on my list of places to get back to. But this brings an end to part one of Drive the World the movie, Australia and New Zealand. This brought us to kind of the beginning of February, so only about a month into the trip, but already so much had been done. And we were then headed into pretty uncharted territory with regards to the agent leg of Drive the World. And that will be part two coming out next week. So yes, if you don't want to miss the future episodes, looking back on what was an amazing year of 2019, make sure to subscribe now, turn on notifications so you don't miss any future videos, and I'll catch up with you guys very, very soon. <laughs>